Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to another installment of uh, In Conversation Live uh, from the Royal Society of Medicine uh, on behalf of uh, our ancient uh, institution, 215 years old. Um, we were expecting to be interviewing David Knott, the famous uh, surgeon, war surgeon, uh, and Henrietta Bowden-Jones was going to do that interview tonight, but uh, we got a message about 10 days ago that David was so busy in ITU, looking after all those poor patients uh, with COVID that he couldn't do it. So off the uh, substitutes bench came uh, my dear friend, Simon Garfield, novelist uh, and uh, writer extraordinaire, uh, as well as a top journalist and somebody I've known for mm, well over a decade. So Simon, welcome to uh, In Conversation. Tell us a little bit about how you and I met. Gosh, well, um, long time ago, I think. Uh, Tony Elliott, who was used to be my boss at Time Out, um, where I worked for, gosh, eight years in the uh, 80s. Um, and uh, he, this is after I left, he said, um, I might have a, a tale for you. Um, and I said, OK, fine. And then we met. And he said, um, I've got uh, prostate cancer and uh, I'm going to have it out. And um, I, the person who's going to take it out is uh, this, um, this, this weird looking guy called Roger Kirby. <laughs> and, um, he, uh, we, and, then, and then we sort of, you know, he, he made the introduction. And obviously the reason he wanted to get in touch was not just because he wanted to be in the paper uh, as another one of your famous clients, but because he obviously wanted to spread the word. And prostate cancer, we now know a lot more, there's more publicity, there are, you know, dedicated days, there's more money, thanks to you, partly, I think, uh, you know, and your own clinic and all of that. Uh, but in th those days, we knew a little bit less and, and people hadn't come forward in the same way. So it was a kind of brave thing for him to do. And, and then obviously, uh, I talked to, uh, to him, and uh, I talked to you. And then, you know, our relationship with prostate obviously went on. Uh, and, and uh, you know, and I, I came to see you have uh, your, yours out on the uh, on the slab as well. <laughs> That's probably quite a memorable day for you being in the operating theatre. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, was, I mean, it, was a, it was a memorable day for me too, I have to say. Well, bits of it were memorable. I was unconscious for a couple of hours. I yeah. think it was the first, it was the first operation uh, that I um, attended. Um, so yeah, no, it was good. The question is, is always, you know, am I gonna, am I gonna faint and, and uh, all of that? But um, it was, it was extraordinary really, because I remember seeing you, uh, it, you know, in your room um, just before they took me down and then we, we went down uh, together and um, obviously robotics were involved uh, heavily at that point. Not sure if they were when um, Tony had his out, but, um, and uh, yeah, of course, an extraordinary um, thing to see. And then at the end of it, you know, we took a photo, I took a photo, I think, on my iPhone of, of the pro prostate in a little silver dish. Uh, <laughs> and then the, the piece appeared in the, uh, it, it was a magazine that the um, economist used to have called Intelligent Life. And, um, and then I think GQ bought it and, and did exactly, what you wanted, I, the reason that I was there was, you know, was to spread the word. And, and here you are, how many years later, um, yes. looking pretty healthy? <laughs> yeah, I'm still uh, I'm cured, really, because it's eight years now. 2012, that was. So, yeah, I think the, the message is that if you catch prostate cancer early, you can be completely cured. Poor Tony. Uh, in the end, he didn't die. Tony Elliott didn't die of... Uh, prostate cancer, you got lung cancer, he had smoked, I think, a lot. Just let, let's, I know everybody, I'm already getting questions in about um, your your book, uh, A Dog's Best Friend, and we will definitely come on to that, as well as, we'll I want to talk about quite a few of your books, actually, because you've written such fantastic stuff. I've been reading them frantically over the last uh, couple of weeks uh, to catch up. Yeah, uh, you should, how many have you written? 12, 13, 14? Oh, sorry, you haven't read anything now. I think this is my 20th now. Uh, they're not all, I mean, a few of them are books that I've edited, um, especially Second World War Diaries, and I edited a woman's journal who kept this fantastic journal 
Uh, her name is Jean Lucy Pratt and lived up the road from me uh, for a short while. She kept a journal throughout her whole life. So ed edited that, that was a, a labor of love. But I, I think the books I've read, written myself, uh, probably uh, 15, I think. Yeah. Let's go back to the sort of 80s and 90s. I mean, a little bit about Time Out because, and, and it kind of in deference to Tony and his lovely wife, Jane, same, same name as my wife. Um, Th those days in Time Out were pretty amazing, weren't they? I mean, it was just at the kind of, not the, not exactly the swinging 60s, but they were the swinging 80s, really. It was, oh, uh, yeah. I mean, it, it really was a uh, party scene uh, every night. I was obviously, you know, I was obviously way too, um, um, what's the word? I, I just, yeah, I, I was too <laughs> industrious, really, to go out every night. But my, uh, I had, there were two editors there. Uh, when, when I when I joined in 83 and uh, yeah there was a, a place called Coconut Grove I don't know if you remember that and then all sorts of places Covent Garden was just getting huge so the offices were right in the middle of Covent Garden and uh, Covent Garden is not like it was uh, or not like it is now it wasn't such um, you know it was just a, a tourist trap in a way uh, and it had some really interesting clubs and I mean I remember all sorts of wonderful uh, nights as I said I kind of behaved myself um, but um, just I don't know we, we just went out with you know lots of bands and we, we uh, I, I, I remember just a big long night with, with um, Kid Creole of Kid Creole and the Coconuts that went till till four or five and I think I ended up with with someone sort of you know, dancing on the tables. So that was, uh, it was, it was a very different scene. But then again, Time Out was a, a very different uh, magazine then. It was a hugely influential thing. Uh, and this was at the time when Time Out had um, a um, pretty much carte blanche on, on uh, to, to sort of run all the listings without any competition at all. So this was before all the Sunday magazines had their culture sections and it was before um, uh, there was a big battle that Tony had actually with with the the Beeb because the Beeb had a monopoly. Uh, you had to buy the Radio Times at that point because that was the only way you could find out uh, along with the TV Times what was on. And it was the same with Time Out. If you wanted to find out what was on at you know the Hammersmith Odeon in those days or your lo lo your local Odeon, um, uh, you sort of had to buy Time Out. And having a cover on Time Out was you know, a pinnacle really. Uh, it, it was, you know, every band and uh, every um, actor wanted to be uh, on there. Um, and, uh, and, and, and things have obviously changed, you know, um, it's, a, it, it, it's now a, a free thing, still important and still does a lot of, you know, I think really good um, London uh, news and uh, it's, 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 you know, a, a very va valuable thing, but, um, it was, it was a very different thing. So I worked my way up. I began writing about music uh, on the music listings uh, and seeing some awful bands in awful dive bars. And then I became a features editor and then I ended up editing the, the whole thing. And uh, it was sort of extraordinary, but it was also a really formulaic uh, magazine then that you sort of knew what was going to sell. And so the big fee features that we had, you know, there was always a Paris guide. People would always go over to Paris for the weekend. That sold very well. The Covent Garden guide sold fantastically well. Um, if you put Tom Cruise on the cover in the 80s, that was the thing as well. Um, and it, I just got a bit bored after a while, really. It just, it just became a little bit too easy. And the features, which is something I was really interested in, I was really interested in, uh, writing uh, were, were sort of less important. Although, God, I had a glor glorious time. I don't know if you can see behind me, I, I've got a, well, there we go, a, a cover of the Clash album and Pat mm. Smith. And I hung out with all these people. I spent a, you know, I spent a week with you two when they were emerging and interviewed Madonna and all these people. And I kind of, I do miss those days a little bit. I miss the access that I had then. Um, so uh, yeah, those were the, those were the days, but I'm beginning to sound like some sort of old, uh, old fart now. <laughs> well, I'm afraid it happens, but um, it was that that gave you the idea to write your, I think it was your first book was on the music scene and the sort of dark side of it where the bands were being ripped off by the music producer. Exactly. What happened was that George Michael, who uh, I knew a little, uh, I knew a, a little bit, he lived um, near, uh, was, um, 
he was he he basically was in court and uh, he was suing his uh, record company and he'd got a bad deal and i did a piece uh on that and on uh, and uh, interviewed him and tried to sort of explain you know why he was on top of the pops um you know with with wham and uh had to get the bus home because he couldn't afford a cab and um it was it was it was a piece that kind of got quite a lot of attention because people didn't sort of, you know, if you were on a popular magazine, didn't write, you know, write about those things very much. And I was really lucky. So uh, the head of uh, Faber, also no longer around, I'm afraid, uh, called Matthew Evans, got in touch, Lord Evans, he became, um, got in touch and said, look, you know, you've done this thing about George, but would it make a book? And, and I said, oh, yeah, I mean, everyone got ripped off you know from I, I mean I went back to um obviously um the Beatles and the Stones and the Who and Elton John and everybody ended up in court there was this saying you know where there's a hit there there's a writ and that's what happened so everyone signed bad deals so the book was an explanation of what these deals were and why they were so bad and it was an attempt to explain how, how the, the music industry works I mean it's not it's not in print anymore, the book. It's, it's now horribly out of date. I mean, this was obviously the time before um, digital downloads and, and I think before CDs even, you know, sort of the bar, bark of this, but a, a really kind of interesting time. And yeah, and that sort of got me on my way. Well, we're going to come on to AIDS in a minute, but just before we do, you know, I think the very first of these in conversations we did, we had Stephen Fry uh, Henry Marsh and Rachel Clark, and the idea was to talk there about medical writing. But of course, Stephen Fry is, is such a brilliant communicator uh, that he managed to to uh, slightly overwhelm even uh, Rachel Clark, who's a pretty hard lady to uh, overwhelm, and to Henry. But um, you know, I, I think a lot of of our listeners, we've got nearly a thousand viewers, listeners uh, from the RSM. You know, most doctors think they they've got a book inside them. But you know, luckily, it stays inside them. It doesn't actually come out. Uh, and because I, I don't think many doctors can write well, there are a few brilliant examples: Atul Gawande uh, uh, and the, the, the doctors I mentioned. Henry just lives down the road from from me. Um, but you know, tell us tell us a little bit about how you kind of sat down and wrote that first. But were you working in that time? And now, tell us up. You know, up these twenty books later. Your kind of writing technique, sort of tips for the the audience, so they can <laughs> they can get their well, book out, even if it doesn't sell. Um, yeah, it's. I mean, it, it is interesting because you know, occasionally, as you said, you know, if if you if you're in the medical world, uh, especially you know, someone who writes so interestingly as Henry Marsh, and and you can translate it to a bigger audience. I mean, Adam Kay is another example. I mean, he's. I yeah. suppose more on the sort of comedic side and, and his experience isn't, you know, isn't top level um, surgery. But if you can do both, then it's fantastic. And people can't get um, enough of that. And there's some great ones in America. Abraham uh, Vergesi was one who I really admired when I was doing my um, AIDS book. I mean, the simple answer is it's very, very difficult if you've been schooled in academic writing, if everything has to have a reference if uh, you can only talk in uh, medical terms if you don't maybe have the best bedside manner uh, it's then going to be very difficult to um, write in a popular way now obviously your writing as uh, a specialist is incredibly important in the medical field but if you want to reach a wide a wide audience it's very, it's very hard I mean I had the I had the opposite thing in a way. So uh, my uh, second book was about AIDS. It was quite a long gap between my music industry book and my AIDS book. And- um, That was 94, right? This right. Is, yeah, this was sort of 94, just before the big drugs um, came in. And um, that came about because um, AZT was, was uh, everyone hoped was going to be the wonder drug and was um, going to be uh, the drug that was going to kind of see people through. Um, when the Concord trials came out, I'm sure some of uh, our viewers will remember those, it was a big disappointment. And I wrote a piece, this is when I left Time Out and I joined The Independent, I wrote a piece um, which uh, 
we tried to explain what AZT was. And for that, I wanted some background and I couldn't find a popular history, something that put it into a popular context for you know, a general newspaper re reader. So I kind of thought, okay, uh, AIDS needs to be written about. Uh, it's just obviously such an important thing. And it was something that I was incredibly conscious of when I was working at Time Out. There was uh, quite a lot of uh, gay uh, guys that I worked with, uh, one of whom became very unwell. And uh, I sort of got involved in that scene. I'm not gay myself, but I kind of thought, okay, well, maybe that helps in a way, you know, I mean, I know obviously it wasn't just gays, but the majority was, that was the thing we can talk about, it's a sin on Channel 4 as well, you know, because that, that's extraordinary, brought it back to life. But yeah. um, it's, uh, the thing that I felt was, well, maybe it'll help if you actually, this is, you know, this subject is tackled um, from a political and a social and a medical point of view, from someone who isn't in the AIDS world, because the AIDS world at that point, if you were an activist, uh, you tended to be very angry. They looked, tended to be lots of internecine worlds, quite rightly angry, you know, with obviously how slow the government uh, was uh, responding here. And, you know, the shortage of drugs and gosh, isn't it interesting, you know, uh, how quickly uh, the COVID uh, vaccine has come along. And, it, you know, isn't it interesting how slow the AIDS drug, drugs were? And you wonder why that was, you know, um, and it's, um, so anyway, so I said, uh, I set about, I introduced myself. My fear, of course, was that people were going to say, actually, you know, you don't understand the medicine, but I had some fantastic guides. So Professor uh, Tony Pinching at Barts and Michael Adler at the, Mid at the Middlesex were fantastically important. Uh, they saw the first cases and they opened up their files to me and I saw government minutes and meetings that they'd attended. So, uh, you know, that was an extraordinary um, thing and, and uh, you know, as I said, watching it, it's a sin, which I, I think you've seen, um, Roger, is, yeah. um, gosh, that brings it back. I, I'm not sure why it's taken so long for someone like Russell T. Davis to come along and, and write something as convincing as that and, and, yeah. and, and moving and compelling as that. But, God, you know, one really cares. I think that that programme is going to win some prizes. But your book won a prize, didn't it? Tell, tell us that story about the, uh, the show... <laughs> Again, so it won, it won something called the Somerset Maugham Award. Look, so here we are. We've got the red uh, ribbon here, and we've got the, the award banner here. But yeah. this, you can see, is spelt correctly, and Somerset with one M. Uh, when uh, it was first, so it won the award, great. Uh, it was it then obviously made it into paperback. When the paperback was first printed, they printed 10,000 copies, and... Um, Somerset had two M's, so they pulked all 10,000 <laughs> copies. This was a um, favour in their wisdom. Great publishers um, that they are. Um, uh, everyone makes mistakes. And uh, so there, there we go. They had to re reprint the, the yeah, whole you lot. You probably um, read through the text and checked every word in the text, but you don't check the cover. Uh, it, it was bizarre. I mean, I think I think what, what, what happened was obviously the text is kind of proofread and proofread and 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 uh, legally checked and everything else. And I go through it a mere million times. I didn't see the the jacket until it came came out. But obviously, a jacket the, the designer, um, you know, is given the instructions, and it's a it's 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 a simple it's a simple mistake. To yeah. Make. Well, let's let's go back to it's a sin because uh, you know I, I think that's a fantastic program because I th I think what it what it really encapsulates is the kind of shame uh, associated with it and and uh, the fact that that I mean that they showed that government advertisement you know don't die of ignorance which is so gloomy uh, and those boys uh, in in uh, just just personify how they had were having a wonderful time but they were so ashamed that they couldn't talk about it and when they got ill. They were treated uh, like lepers and isolated in those dreadful scenes where they're kind of locked away and everybody comes in with um, with, with uh, all this protective gear. So it kind of resonates with now. So I mean, what did you think of uh, of it, Cecily? You... I thought it was. I, I I was so moved. There's lots of series that I watch uh, with my wife that we sort of give up on halfway because we think. It's either not to us or we're too old, or we're, uh, it's just, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't hit the mark. And this, you kind of think, I just can't wait to see the next one. And, uh, and you, you care instantly about these guys. I mean, beautifully construct, constructed, fantastically well acted. And 
what an education for, for, for sort of people who just don't know that world. You know, people, um, I mean, fortunately, uh, HIV in this country and in the West is obviously now a very treatable uh, illness. Um, and in those days, as you say, it wasn't. I mean, I remember a you know, terrible joke about, um, you know, you said about people being uh, locked away and stuff and food being left outside. I remember the joke and how true that was. You know, we saw in the TV series that just a plate of food being left out and, and, and the guy lying in the hospital saying, you know, they weren't bringing it in. And I remember a terrible joke about, you know, a guy with AIDS saying, um, yeah, they keep on feeding me high vita. And, I, and, and someone said, well, why high vita? And they said, because that's the only thing they can slip under the door. And uh, you think, God, that's really terrifying and sort of true, uh, you know. And uh, so all that fear, uh, the, the fear of the medical prof profession uh, up to a point, or, or, I mean, not, not the people who knew what they were talking about, but the hospitals, uh, that incredible uh, prejudice um, shown by um, sort of so many uh, in the church in particular, but obviously also in political um, circles. And, it's an odd one with AIDS and Greer Britain, I think, because um, we don't get an indication at the end of It's a Sin. Maybe Russell T. Davis will do part two and show what happens at the end. But in a way, that book ends, sorry, that film ends where my book uh, ends, really, which is before the combination therapies came in, before the retrovirals came in. Um, and it's just people dying and people going to funerals, you know, every day, every week. I mean, S Stephen Fry, who is in my book, uh, in the AIDS book, um, obviously plays this um, self-loathing, you know, sort of denying uh, horrible Tory politician sucking up to uh, Maggie um, and, and, and saying, you know, oh, I'm, only, I'm only with you, this is a, a black gay guy because, you know, it's, 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 it's good, good to, to sort of, you know, smell some shit when you, when you, and then you appreciate how glorious the, the air is sort of when you leave. And I mean, just horrific stuff and fantastic that he played that. I mean, that's obviously so against type. And um, it's, um, yeah, I mean, an extraordinary series. I, I, was, I was sort of in tears at the end and absolutely right. I mean, I, I did get my book out at that point. So, you know, and it reminded me of kind of various um, things and there was actually a nice bit. There was nice. There was an interview in the big issue um, which someone um, sent me with uh, the guy who played uh, Ro uh, Roscoe, um, who um, is, is one of the few main characters who who actually does not get HIV. And he said he used my book as a reference. So I'm very pleased for that. The sad thing, of course, is um, that it is now out of print and it's not even on an ebook. So um, I'm going to talk to my agent, hopefully tomorrow, and, uh, and, and try and get that back into print in some way, even if it's, if it's just uh, di you know, digitally online. Yeah, I think you should. You, know, with a, you could write a sort of prologue to it, to uh, bring it up to date, and then, because it's, it's great writing. Uh, well, I, a few questions, because Alison Macefield agrees that It's a Sin's amazing series, and uh, she says it's surprising we're still trying to get people to take notice about AIDS. But, I mean, going back a little bit, uh, uh, Paul Dinsale says um, he thinks you, you once interviewed Bob Dylan, and he said, um, uh, uh, as in the cat when you told him your name. <laughs> yeah, so, my God. Um, so were, how, how, what was it like? How, interview the great man. How does Paul know that? No, so I never got to Dylan, but I, I went to Israel. So Bob Dylan playing Israel. Uh, Bob Dylan, as you know, has sort of um, um, had uh, come under the influence of every religion in the world. And there was a big uh, Jewish uh, phase, there was a big Christian phase. Um, so he, he played in Israel and Bob Dylan playing in Israel at that point uh, in the 80s was a very significant thing uh, for him, because he played Jer Jerusalem, and obviously for Israel as well. This was a sort of, you know, this is um, this is dear old uh, Robert Zimmerman um, coming in um, sort of at last, sort of coming home, you know, pro pro prodigal son. Anyway, so I, I went for time out to try and get an interview, but at least I'd be reporting on the car concept, which was the kind of the main thing, really. And um, I, uh, I, I did find out which hotel he was at, 
And uh, I sent a note up to him and said, you know, blah, blah, blah. I, you know, I know you don't give many interviews, but you and Israel, this is a big thing, blah, blah, blah. And um, how, how about it? And I signed Simon Garfield. And then I just got a note back in his, well, I, I hope it was in his handwriting, but or maybe it was one of his minders, which just said, as in the cat, question mark. And that was it. No interview, but, you know, hey, I have a little note from Bob Dylan, so. Yeah, I will come on to some of your letters. So maybe that, that's going to be one famous one. Well, Kate Richards brings up a good point because she said Paul Kalanithi wrote When Breath Becomes Air, which was brilliant. And, and you know, going back a little bit to medical writing, uh, I, I, we mentioned that when we were talking before this program. I mean, that that's uh, in a way uh, kind of resonates with what we've been talking about with the AIDS issue and the and young people dying. How, how, what do you think of that as, as medical writing? Oh, yeah, no, that's, I mean, ter terrific, really. Sort of anything that, you know, f for me, it's, it somehow has to um, either tug a heartstring, which that absolutely did, or resonate in some way. And, you know, obviously, as everyone grows older, one becomes more and more aware of things, you know, falling off or, or going wrong. And, and, you know, those issues are sort of extraordinary. I mean, hence, Henry Marsh, for me, is sort of the one because it 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 encapsulates so many philosophical issues as well, you know, of 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 the of the brain and um, consciousness and uh, you know a, a surgeon's duty. I mean, do no harm. The great mm. Hippocratic oath is obviously you know the key to to it. So yeah, I mean, you know, uh, the the. the the, the the other book that I, I really love um, is, as I said, I mentioned this guy called Abraham Vergesi. It's called Soundings, which is uh, a young American um, medic's experience of, of AIDS at first hand. And, and, and that also is, is definitely something, um, you know, you want to hunt out. Um, but um, it's, you know, I mean, I know, Roger, you've written um, several important um, textbooks um, about um, about uh, prostate cancer and uro urology in general, um, and it's um, you know you you must know when you write for a more general uh, audience, you know how hard it can be to to sort of you know to to um, to, to explain such complex medical issues that, that you know you're reading about in the lancet and the bmj and to somehow explain that i mean again sort of going back to aids maybe the last thing we talk about aids um is the government really tried hard i i they took a long time way too long to actually realize how important uh hiv was but then when the chief medical officer um sir donald Acheson, got involved in it, he kind of, he persuaded Thatcher um, that this was something that we had to talk about and address the nation. And, and although Thatcher sort of wanted to wash her hands of it, Norman Fowler, uh, who, who, was, who was then um, health um, secretary, uh, kind of realized this was something that uh, was potentially going to affect uh, everyone. And, and gay men were very keen to sort of emphasize the fact that this could affect everyone in one sense, because that's how they would get the funding, that's how they would get the word out. If they, if they said, oh, it's sort of 90% gay men, then they feared, and as was the case, they weren't gonna get the um, attention. So it played both, both ways. To Britain's credit and to the, to the Thatcher government's credit, we did sort of get it right in the end, you know, those mass leaflet drops, those big, John Hurt tombstone ads that I'm sure a lot of viewers remember as well. Don't die of ignorance. You know, gay men looked at that and said, you know, how long, how long is it going to be until you know, uh, you know, how, how long would it would, did you take to realise about this? Uh, but in the end, it kind of worked, and uh, we we uh, you know we 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 did we did control things and we did educate people, and obviously. Lots of great activists, outrage, the Terence Higgins Trust, incredibly important uh, as well. So we, we have, you know, we have a record of, 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 of not uh, acting fast enough, but when we did, we acted well. And, and you know, maybe we could make the same argument about um, um, COVID. Yeah. 
Well, I, I like that call out for Leanne Donaldson. Actually, he was he was originally a urologist. He, he he was an SHO in urology, but I think he didn't didn't like looking up people's urethras into their their bladder. So he went into public health, and and he not only uh, was a pioneer in 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 AIDS and getting that on the agenda, he did some great work for patient safety. He was one of the first people in the world to take an interest in in, in patient uh, safety. Yeah. So and Norman Fowler too. Lord Fowler still yeah. uh, is around. Out, isn't he making do, doing good stuff i think so l- listen i got i put i sat here deliberately with my map of the world behind me because i know you've written a book on maps and i was uh, reading it and, and i loved your story of the library in alexandria and the kind of early early days of maps so let, before we i know we're gonna have a lot of people saying let's do dogs we i want to read uh, about this this, but we will plug your book, I promise. But before we do that, uh, before we go to dogs, let's do maps. So tell us about, you know, what, that's a kind of crazy idea to write a book about maps. Well, I, the thing that I love to do is to take a, an impossibly big subject and sort of boil it down. So, you know, I've written, I don't know, typefaces and, and, um, and, 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 and maps are kind of obvious ones and, and then, you know, dogs as well. So I kind of think, well, the great thing, if you if you decide to write a book about maps, and I was I was asked to uh, write one, um, is that you you don't have to do the definitive book about maps. What you have to do is an interesting book about maps. So there are so many wonderful map stories. I mean, we you know, maps are the way we educate ourselves about the world. Before we read about the world, we see ourselves, you know, on a map. We place ourselves. Um, and we couldn't get around without maps. I mean, forget GPS, but I'm talking about, you know, the exploration of the world, the way we understand uh, what lies in relation to, to where, how we get to any, you know, any place. Um, so I kind of thought, okay, well, this is great because there must be a million good tales. And I took, I don't know, 40 good tales. Um, and yeah, the great library of Alexandria, you know, that's where the first maps um came in and i talk it begins with um ptolemy um you know amazingly getting so much right about what lay uh, where in in the world and then great mistakes and and you know dubious mountain ra- ranges the mountains of com that existed in africa for 200 years because people used to just copy maps you know it's not, not like now where you can easily go and see that something doesn't exist in those days uh you know a map kit was published in um uh, you know, in London, and people just copied it as gospel, um, and um, and then it went all over the world. And then, um, only about 150 years uh, after this map of Africa uh, was um, printed, I think uh, the explorer was uh, um, Mungo, who basically hadn't um, heard, uh, sort of hadn't seen the maps um, uh, himself. Basically, came back. Uh, and said, oh, no, these mountains of Kong exist. And then actually 150 years later, we found there, there isn't a mountain range, you know, bisecting Africa. So, um, yeah, all sorts, of, uh, all sorts of fun tales. The irony, of course, as my wife will testify, is I am the worst map reader in the <laughs> world. And our marriage has been saved, uh, like many marriages, like many relationships, I am sure, by uh, sat-nav and um, GPS. Well, hi, Justin, if you're watching your husband, uh, p- possibly next door, hi, hi from me. Um, I'm, I'm being helped here by the questions coming in, although uh, actually it's so easy to interview, Simon, I don't really need the help. But um, I, I, Kevin Doyle says, you've written on a wide variety of subjects, typefaces, dog stamps. What draws you into a subject? And how far do you have to go before you know there's a book in it? I mean, how many blind alleys have you gone up? I mean, you might have done a book on have you done a book on thought about drain pipes or <laughs> um not toilet drain pipes. what a fine idea uh, roger uh, no um so the, the simple answer is um i mean it's sort of you want to your own question in a way you know it's, sort of, it's like is there enough to keep me interested in this um for a year and a half or, or two 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 years that's the answer so uh has to be something I'm genuinely, genuinely interested in. Uh, I always say, this is great because I'm being paid to get an education. So it's, it's usually a topic that I know a bit about that I want to find out a lot more about. And, uh, you know, the, the, the joy of um, getting, you know, a, 
a, a pile of books from the London Library this big and, and, and going through uh, is, is, is great. And uh, obviously talking to people. I mean, the, because I trained as a journalist, the important thing for me is, is not to do an ivory tower book, is not to do a book where I just sit and um, sort of, you know, add 1% of what everyone else has, has already found out. But I do try and talk to as many people as I can. So with the maps book, I talk to cartographers and a globe maker and, you know, uh, sort of all of that. So um, sort of that's the, the, the key. So is there enough, um, is there enough that I can read about, are there enough interesting people uh, who, who I can um, talk about uh, and talk to? But the, the main interest really, or the main answer is that there just have to be things that I'm, I'm kind of personally interested in. I'm, I've, you know, been very um, lucky that, that, you know, there are enough subjects and enough editors and enough buyers and enough readers um, to, to kind of make it work. Well, you, you do write great prose, but, you know, I, I, I've seen you sort of pedaling around London on that bike of yours, and so far you haven't been knocked off, which is good. Oh, I have, I have. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, no, I broke, broke my elbow, so um, I, in Hyde Park, classically, coming back, I said we wouldn't mention Chelsea because we're both... <laughs> That's so supporters of, 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 of well, great, great supporters of the Snow Popper Club. But the um, yeah, coming back from a Chelsea game five years ago, uh, in that, in that they've now changed it. There was a sort of like little bike lane in Hyde Park, and uh, a woman um, went into the bike lane, knocked me off my bike, broke my elbow. But here we are, anyway. When you're not being knocked off your bike, when you stay on it, you 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 end up um. Well, in the past, in the in the libraries and so on. But I mean, COVID for the last year, can you still go to libraries or are they verboten now? You're allowed to. You well, know? I mean, I tell everyone that in a way, lockdown hasn't affected uh, me and hasn't affected writers that much because obviously, what we do is we we kind of sit on our bum anyway and look at a screen for most of our lives. Um, and so, in that that sense, it hasn't affected me. But the library, the London library, which is the main one I go to, is closed. And I'm a writer who finds it quite hard just to sit at home in my office where I am now uh, and just write, you know, sort of nine to five. I need to go to coffee bars. I need to talk to people. I need to see people. Even if I'm on my, you know, I like, I like that white noise, even if I'm on my uh, laptop. Um, but the main thing I miss, which I find very hard, and this absolutely, I'm sure will um, resonate with other uh, authors is that you need that outside ins inspiration you know we, we we work on a screen we read a lot then in the evening we watch another screen a bigger screen a tv but what we can't do is um go and see your daughter in the theater well, well you know, Roger, that's you know uh, the one of the last fine fine things that we saw was um uh, her in a, in a version of miss julie uh, right. national i miss that so much. I miss the theatre, I obviously miss the football a bit, uh, I miss the music, and it's just that going out, the exhibitions, just just that kind of treat at the end of the day. I mean, not every day, obviously, but, you know, that kind of thing. So you need that inspiration and to have, to have um, you know, to have output, you need input. And, and so I kind of feel that, that, that I really miss and obviously can't wait to go back. But I should say, because we have an audience, uh, congratulations to you. It must have been an amazing day for you to, to see Vanessa, Roger's daughter, um, be nominated for a Golden Globe. <laughs> yeah, we're, pr we're proud of our daughter, we really are. And um, yeah. coming back to what you're saying, I mean, I, you know, I, I think people of our generation, I'm, I'm older than you, Simon, uh, now, but you know, the kind of baby boomers haven't been badly affected by this COVID, but Vanessa and all her uh, friends in the arts uh, world, you know, they've been really badly affected. They miss their friends so badly, they, all their shows are off. I mean, she was lucky to have made uh, pieces of a woman before all the mayhem, but they've, the, the, a lot of the filming has been uh, on hold. And uh, yeah, we're just hoping that uh, the vaccines work and, you know, bounce back better is my favorite uh, expression at the moment. And uh, hopefully we can open up the RSM and welcome all our, our pals back in there. But yeah, COVID has been worse for the arts. I mean, you know, of course, young doctors, I mean, there'll be some young, young doctors watching this and they've been redeployed from their training into ITU and, and working like hell, but at least they've been kind of doing something. 
whilst the people in the arts and the restaurant business and retail, you know, they're, they're on hold for a whole year now. So uh, we feel sorry for them. There's a, there's a question about tip, typography coming in. Let me just open that up. What's your interest, says John Besford. Thanks, John, for the question. What's your interest in, in typography? Because um, uh, it's my type. Uh, is that, did I get the, right, the, the title right? Just my type. Just my type, yeah, sorry. Uh, just my type, yeah, that's a fun book. And uh, uh, you, you make mention of uh, Apple uh, and um, Steve Jobs and so on. Um, to, to tell us a little bit about that. And, and I like, I, I thought that was a really interesting book. Well, I mean, anyone who works on a computer, and I've been on, on uh, I've been on, on a Mac for, you know, years and years and years, um, is interested in the drop down menu, you know, the way that if you have one typeface, you write a paragraph and it looks quite serious and, and quite important. And it's, it's, it's the, you know, your CV is in Times New Roman, it's a job application or whatever it is. And then, of course, you go down the the, the sort of typeface menu and you can go into Comic Sans, which is, uh, you know, many people regard as both both the, the, the best educational and the worst looking typeface uh, in, you know, in, in, in the world. Uh, or you can have Courier, which is also, you know, quite a sober one. Or you can have Georgia, which is a lovely warm typeface or uh, American typewriter, which looks like an old fashioned typewriter. And you put the same paragraph into a different typeface and it looks different. It tells a different tale. It has a different emotional heat and uh, it, it has a, a different kind of weight uh, to, to, to it, uh, even if the content is exactly the same. So I thought, well, again, you know, this is something I'm interested in as a writer. Uh, where do typefaces begin? They go back all the way to Gutenberg, um, uh, where sort of the first Gutenberg typeface was one that imitated scribes, you know, because that was the only one that people could read. Uh, in the 15th um, century. And so it, the, the book covers the whole history of um, typefaces um, and, you know, big, small, and, and how they're used and why they're so important in our lives. I mean, you, you know, you, you cannot leave your, your uh, home uh, without being inundated uh, with a hundred different typefaces within the first two minutes of walking down a high street. Um, and they're there for a reason, you know, they're, if you've got something called pap papyrus, that might adorn, I don't know, a Greek restaurant. It's an old, you know, an old sort of typeface that looks like it's falling uh, to pieces like the par Parthenon. Um, uh, or you may get something ultra modern, which uh, is, you know, your new, um, uh, sort of high tech uh, head, head, headquarters, and it's going to be in something that may maybe actually, you know, won't be a um, a brand new typeface, but but it's is one that just looks new. So all those things, and I was kind of interested in that. And again, fortunately, all sorts of great typeface uh, designers. No money in typeface design, I should say. So they had uh, they were more than willing to talk and share their uh, tips and uh, see secrets. So I talked to a lot of modern designers and try to explain why, you know, surely we must have enough A's and G's and H's by now, but all over the world, there are people designing new ones. Why is that? What are we trying to say? So uh, yeah, that was um, a lot of fun to do. Yeah, I, th I think it's a kind of inspirational book. I was reading it ahead of this interview, and you know, I, I'm one of these really boring people that I uses either Times New Roman or Helvetica the whole time, and there are all these options there, uh, and I never really thought about using them before. But you know, you, you're absolutely right. If if you like words, then you should really take more uh, interest in that. There's, there, there's actually a really there's a really fun tale in the book of a guy who um, tried to live. Uh, I think uh, just one day without seeing Helvetica. Helvetica is Swiss typeface, uh, 1950s, very, very clean, and it's used everywhere, you know, it's used uh, American air, air, airlines and uh, all sorts of kind of uh, uh, banks, and uh, it's used on um, currency, whatever you go, it's fantastically clear, used a lot for signposting. Uh, as well. Um, and um, he tried to live a day without it, but he couldn't because this was in America. Uh, 
It's the subway front uh, for um, the New York subway. It's on the dollar bill. Uh, you pick up a book, uh, the chances are uh, the um, uh, typeface is uh, Helvetica, maybe on the jacket, if not, if not the, uh, the text itself. Uh, you, um, uh, you, you, you go to a clothing store like American um, Apparel, I think that's what it's called. Um, and um, again, it's in Helvetica. And uh, so uh, he failed, he failed miserably. Uh, and then obviously on your phone, you used to be on the hell there on your phone as well. So. Interesting. I'm just going to give a call out for Stephen Chalican because uh, his son, Ben, he's a bit of a superstar urologist, uh, budding urologist now. Well, he's already budded actually, to be honest. Um, Stephen says, for those working with HIV, it's important to stress globally that more women now are living with, with HIV uh, than men, you know, I think um, that we forget that, that, that women uh, are, are impacted by that. But, but um, let, let's move on to another book, which is, uh, you, you keep, I know you love letters, uh, written letters, and you've written a couple of books on those. Um, and uh, yeah, that is becoming a bit of a lost art because everybody churns out, you know, their emails. Um, I, I'm interested to see, everybody writes these texts and they usually, once they've written their text, they can't bear to read them. They just send them because they're so, you know, got to press the, the send button and the, the corrective uh, uh, things, you, you, uh, corrective text has usually changed a lot of the words into, so it's quite a bit of it is gobbledygook, but nobody seems to care. You know, they accept that, you know, texts are full of errors and they're not really thought through and they're never reread. So, to, yeah, what what got you interested in in those books? I and, and tell, I like those stories about the the, uh, the 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 stories from the Hadrian's Wall uh, that the, the old Romans were talking about. Yeah, I, I, I mean, if you're an author and you you do any sort of historical research, you are going to be interested in letters uh, and, and in correspondence. Um, so. Um, it's how we tell our history, you know. We are not going to find uh, love emails in the attic. We are not going to find troves of uh, a famous person and not famous person, non-famous person's uh, letters, which will tell us about their lives. Um, so I kind of think it's a lost cause, uh, you know, as you, as, as you say. Uh, you know, um, I'm not sure that my kids could really, you know, sort of write the traditional letter with you know the way we understand it the way i was taught at school you know with the address here and then uh, the the um uh the, the you know you you write your thing and then you space it in a certain way and kind of all that sort of stuff and that's it is a lost time a glorious glorious thing because i think we write letters in a way that we don't communicate digitally you know we, obviously we can write emails obviously we can send texts and you know anything on whatsapp but these are obviously very short. They tend to be punchy. They tend to be not thought about very, very, very much. You know, if you don't reply to an email within half a day, someone thinks you're dead. So it's very, very um, interesting to look at how we wrote letters. We had a beginning, a middle and end. I think we thought there was a, uh, I say, I think in, in, in my book, you know, there's a, a slower cerebral whirring. You know, the idea that we just thought about things. Maybe we wrote about a whole week. Um, and so it's, and obviously a letter tells you far more about the writer's sort of, you know, emotional condition at, at the time. You, you get far more from the person, you get their handwriting. Uh, you get the care I think it takes as well. You know, to write a letter, sit down, uh, go to the post office. Um, but I can absolutely understand people who will say, well, hang on a minute, you know, this takes three days to arrive and it costs me a pound to send a letter and I've got to go to the post box and it might get lost you know where's where's the fun in that but obviously as I said the his, historical importance is, is extraordinary I mean we had a very nice um uh, th there was a very very nice offshoot uh, as a result of my letter book and also a fantastic book um which if you're uh you know if, if our um um viewers don't, don't know it you must get called uh, letters of note big coffee table book beautifully produced reproduced uh, letters from uh, the, the the great and the good and uh, unknown and not uh, unknown and, and, and uh, fantastically famous people corresponding uh, 
pretty much over the last kind of, you know, 100, 100 200 years. And um, this came out the same day as my book published by the same company. And we had a fantastic lit, small launch uh, where Benedict Cumberbatch and various other great actors uh, came along and read some of these letters from my book and Sean Usher's book, The Letters of Note Compiler. And then this, this developed and, and, and Benedict um, said, well, hang on a minute, this is, um, you know, this is, this is a great night. This is a really interesting thing. And then he formed a company with uh, my publishers um, called uh, uh, Le Le Letters Live. Um, and we met in a pub and, and, and I came up with the title of Letters Live and then uh, my publisher at the time uh, came up, said, opened his black book and said, well, we can get Jude Law to read them, we can get Stephen Fry to read them, we can get uh, Olivia Coleman uh, to read them, we can get Vanessa Kirby to read them. And uh, so we, we form a company and uh, we do these fantastic shows. I'm not as involved with this as, as I, I used to, to be, um, but fantastic shows. So if you, post COVID, things will get back to normal. If you see an advert for a, um, a show called Letters Live, uh, do come along because we don't announce who is going to uh, be performing, but it's, uh, it's A-list people and they read um, fantastically well and bring these old letters to life, to, to life and, and really emphasize as, as um, you know, nothing else, uh, how important uh, letters are. Great. Listen, we're, we're running out of time because you're, you're talking so beautifully, uh, Simon, but, but um, uh, Shabir Harun says, what's your famous, uh, favorite bit of memorabilia in your study, and is that a photograph of Jim Morrison on the back? <laughs> so um, oh. no, it's a <laughs> it's a photo, it's an album cover, signed album cover from Patti Smith, a famous horses album, one of my favorite albums. And then uh, well, what else do we have behind there? We have um, a, uh, a a Henry Ma Matisse print, uh, not an original, I should say, and then some some something. Uh, print, uh, made by uh, one of my sons and some tube maps and then behind my head we have the signed Clash album. I was a huge Clash <laughs> fan when I was 17 and 18 and I, I went on, I followed them on tour. I wasn't writing about them, I was just a, a, a fan and, 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 and went to see them. So there you go, that's a bit of the collection. But yeah, so this is the, that's the one that's out now. This is, uh, I think, we should regard this, Roger, as the official launch of this book, because it comes yeah, out tomorrow. Dogs, 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 tomorrow. dogs. Dogs, bear, bear, best friend. So my editor, um, Jenny, who uh, I, I've been with for um, a few books now, came up with the idea, said, look, you know, you've written about so many other things. Uh, you've had dogs for um, 30 years in your, in your life. Why don't you write about dogs? Something you obviously love. And something that hopefully will explain our relationship with dogs. You know, why do we live with dogs and not a beaver? You know, what is it about our relationship? How is that bond developed? How did it begin? And how has it changed over the years? And like, who's in charge now? Which is obviously, if you're a dog owner, you kind of always wonder that, you know, he dictates the, the dog, he or she dictates. Uh, is, uh, you know, when you feed him or her, um, how much money are you going to spend on the insurance and vet bills, when they need to be taken out for walks? Oh, you can't go on holiday because you've got a dog. So dominate, dominate our, our lives uh, in an extraordinary way. So it's an attempt to explain that history uh, over, the, over the years. And I, I want to show you one thing, which I, I think my favourite page is not a page of text, of course, nothing I've written, but this is my favourite single page in the whole book, which is um a cover from private eye oh yeah uh, yeah last year. And basically it's a new cabinet and they're all poodles so uh, <laughs> there we are i think that's great another you know there's a, a work and pension secretary who looks like he's, he's really re raring to go um and that that tells you quite a lot about you know we, ha have dogs have, have dogs and humans become almost interchangeable and it's also about our you know, anthropomorphic relationship. Are, are, are we in risk of losing um, the kind of essential dogness of dogs? Are we trying to make them too like us? So when they have, you know, a particular face, do we see that as guilt? Is it guilt? You know, so it's all those things. So I talk to a lot of people, attend dog shows and um, have 
have a lot of fun with that. One quote from that book is, you know, you, you, you can find a dog that you can keep in your handbag, it's so small, or one that won't even fit in your car because it's so big. Uh, but I mean, the timing was brilliant because of course COVID, apparently dog sales have uh, quadrupled uh, and, and the prices have gone up. Is that right? The prices- yeah, no, it's, it's extraordinary. I mean, it's not a great thing in one sense. It's great that so many, you know, more families have dogs and have found the, the love of dogs. But uh, it, it, the downside of that is that, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of uh, market led. And as you say, prices have gone very crazy. And that there are lots of, uh, well, we hear quite a lot of, you know, dogs being kidnapped, dognapped. Uh, from outside shops because they are now a valuable asset. Uh, and um, uh, a lot of uh, in, uh, sort of, you know, irresponsible and um, uh, unreputable, disreputable uh, dog breeders as well, importing dogs from kind of all over that haven't been bred very well and have been kept in ter terrible conditions. That's the downside of it. Um, the pl plus side is that, you know, the the, the kid who was, who, was, who was for years and years gone on to their parents saying, please, 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 we have to get a dog, has finally got their dog. And they are being lavished with attention and love. I mean, my, my thought is always what's going to happen when we do return to, you know, a sort of normal, some sort of normality. And then we'll go back to work or we'll go out, you know, as we used to do, and, and dogs will be on their own again. Sort of the, uh, you know, how they'll cope with that psychologically i don't know perhaps they'll be thrilled you know maybe they'll think thank god they've gone you know i can i can raid the bins again but uh yeah so i mean i i was finishing the book just at the beginning of the first uh lockdown um and um so it's sort of you know it, it's great in a way that everyone's talking about dogs and interest in uh, dogs and taking dogs for walks now because that's all we can do um but it's uh it's a it's a kind of odd experience as an author trying to launch a book where you can't actually go into the shops. You know, I love doing, I love going to the shop, in a book, into a bookshop, obviously, but I love doing kind of events, you know, a book, uh, you know, festivals. And, you know, as I said, comes out tomorrow, we can't have a launch for them. You know, what a glorious way to celebrate with you, Roger. Um, but it's, um, yeah, it's an odd, it's an odd thing. That. Um, and um, it's, uh, it, it's, you know, as an author, again, one, one isn't kind of thrilled that uh, you can only buy the book online, but things will change. And by the time the misspelt uh, paperback comes out, uh, we'll hopefully be in the clear. And then, so it's, it's launched tomorrow, is it? Is that right? Tomorrow is it, on, online? It is, yeah. yeah. So uh, it's, uh, we can, you know, as a, yeah. you know all, good, all good online bookshops. You can get it, obviously, at Amazon, but go to Waterstones or go to your, you know, local click and collect if, if, if you've got a local bookshop and go there, support the bookshops because goodness knows they, uh, they need it more than ever. They're being hammered, of course. Got one last question from Graham Kidd came in. Do dogs know when their masters are coming home as Rupert Sheldrake believes, he says. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is, you know, who knows? There have been so many experiments about that, you know, uh, and, uh, it's very, very difficult to, to know. You know, we, we, we know less about a, a dog's psychology, although we know more than we did 30 years ago. You know, we can, we, we can, we can, we can travel to Mars now, but, but we, we don't understand anything about how, how a, a dog um, thinks. But there are so many answers to that. You know, obviously a dog gets excited when anyone comes to our house, you know, the doorbell goes, the dog, uh, Ludo, my, my, my aging gentleman of a, of a Labrador, you know, gets up from under my um, under my feet and uh, and thinks, "Hey, this is for me." There's someone at the door for me, delivering finally my food or gifts or whatever it is. So, uh, but do dog owners know when their owners are coming home? We're not coming home. That's the answer now, isn't it? Really, it's sort of we're just here all the time. So, um, and the dogs love that. They love the company. They love that. The questions become redundant, unfortunately, over the last year. But you know. Dogs have an amazing sense of timing. I am convinced that my dog knows when it's six o'clock, when it's, um, you know, sort of dinner time for him. Uh, and wherever he hears the church bells, you know, up our road going, I don't know, but he certainly has an innate sense of, um, of timing and hunger. Simon, we've got to wind up now. One last question. What's your next book? Are you working on the, 
on the next book now or yeah it's uh, it's it's going to be a book about no, uh, knowledge and a book about encyclopedias and it's a book about learning and it's about it began with an article i wrote about wikipedia uh, but it's 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 going back to how we gather knowledge and how we understand the world uh in the um in the in a present age in the digital age and then before so it's about it's sort of about truth as well it's about what you can trust that you read and who writes what and uh and and and, and a little bit of kind of fake news is going to be in there as well so that's really interesting yeah, yeah you know one of my favorite expressions is we we're drowning in a sea of uh, of information but we're thirsting for knowledge because and and i think you know for again younger doctors who i appreciate are having a hard time and and we do our best at the Royal Society of Medicine to support them. And it is tough there, but, they, but there is so much information they have to process. And I guess as you get older, you get good at picking out the, the knowledge, the, the nuggets of knowledge from all that huge amount of information that there is there. But it, that is not an easy thing to do. Simon, we've got to finish here because uh, we like to finish on time. Not, I'm already one minute late. Um, so thank you so much. Don't go away because I've got a few announcements to make. First of all, thank you to you and thank you for your amazing uh, uh, output of those fantastic books. Uh, thank you to the audience. I think there's about a thousand people uh, tuned into this and we usually have about double that number uh, on YouTube who watch these things afterwards. So it will be available uh, if you want to recommend it to other people. Um, we Tomorrow we have Victoria McDonald from uh, Channel 4, health correspondent talking about vaccines. Wow, what could be more topical than that? Um, the Pfizer vaccine, the AZ vaccine, the Moderna vaccine, when they should, when should they be given, what protection do they give, all that stuff. That's at uh, 12.30 tomorrow. Uh, next week, Simon, we've got Simon back again. Simon did a brilliant interview with Maya uh, talking about uh, Auschwitz and uh, 100 years, uh, uh, her age, fantastic lady, fantastic interview. But he's back again uh, interviewing, would you believe it, the Archbishop of Canterbury, a slightly different uh, view from Justin Welby. That's next Wednesday at this time. Uh, just a reminder that um, this uh, webinar is free to you, but it's not free for us to make. So if you are feeling generous, the Royal Society of Medicine has been under the cosh. We've had our building closed for nearly a year now. Uh, we're trying to do our best to sustain our mission to supply education and innovation to the medical profession and beyond that, of, uh, of course. So thanks again to Simon. Thanks uh, again to our audience. Uh, it's been really great talking to you, Simon, and uh, we'll meet in the bar when the bars are open again. Very good. Well, I enjoyed it a great deal. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Bye.